There's mounting international concern over tens of thousands of Russian troops dug in along the border with Ukraine. Russia and NATO have traded warnings. Each side claims it's being threatened by the other. But in the West, one question dominates. What will Vladimir Putin do next? We talked this week to a respected foreign policy analyst in Moscow, Fyodor Lukyanov. Has the West misunderstood Russia's position? And just how dangerous is the current situation? Is it dangerous? Yes, of course it's risky. But this is a high-stake game. And uh, uh, I'm absolutely sure that Mr. Putin, as we know him, well, we know him for pretty, pretty many years already, uh, he is, uh, he's not a gambler. So how did we get to this point and where do we go from here? And what about Putin's intentions at home? Cracking down on opposition and closing the country's oldest civil rights group. All this and more on Conflict Zone. Fyodor Lukyanov, welcome to Conflict Zone. Hello. In your opinion, how likely is Russia to launch a fresh incursion into Ukraine? In my opinion, it's totally unlikely because it's not on the Russian agenda. Never was? Never could be? Not at this point, certainly. I don't know how things will develop in the future because the Ukrainian issue uh, as an international problem, as a problem uh, of Russian uh, political development uh, does exist, of course. But uh, for now, I don't see any chance uh, for that to happen. So the option isn't even on the table at the moment, as far as you're concerned? Uh, I don't mean the, the option is on the table at the moment. I mean that the problem does exist. And uh, what Russia is trying to achieve now it's actually to postpone this problem, maybe in the best case to remove it for the future. But uh, means used now are, so to say, taken from the classical diplomacy, when you need uh, some kind of uh, demonstration in order to get attention of your uh, counterparts to launch a sensible and substantial conversation. So that's the whole rationale for the steady buildup of forces around Ukraine on land, sea and air, 100,000 soldiers on Russia's border with Ukraine. It's all just attention seeking, is it? Uh, it's uh, mostly about uh, to create a situation when uh, uh, Americans, uh, the NATO at large, but in particular Americans, uh, would understand that there is an issue in Europe which should be addressed. And this is not a Ukrainian issue. This is an issue about how uh, European security has been arranged uh, after the Cold War. And this is a very complicated uh, thing. So Russia tried to uh, raise this question many, many times before, including in 90s, especially in 2000s and 2010s. But uh, the problem was that no one even uh, uh, paid attention, no, no one listened to that. And uh, the ideas which Russia tried to promote were not just rejected, they were simply ignored. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, Russian leadership, as I uh, read it, uh, understood that the only way to get attention, to launch a discussion, is to demonstrate force and since uh, the West is uh, uh, very much obsessed with Ukraine in particular, so Ukraine in this regard, sorry to say it, but is rather instrumental. So they wanted to, to get to the West's attention. They drew up a list of demands to NATO, which they knew would be unacceptable, and then threatened dire and unspeakable consequences if NATO turned them down, which of course it did. So what was that all about? Creating a pre pretext for war? Well, it's not a creating a pretext for war. Uh, it's something else, because you say that uh, uh, those demands are unacceptable, which I agree. And of course, in the format uh, as they were put on the table, I cannot imagine any kind of uh, agreement from the NATO side or from the American side. But look at what happened since those demands were uh, raised and were formulated. Already now, despite the fact that the severe uh, political crisis and security affairs crisis is in place in Europe, 
already now we have uh, U.S. acceptance and U.S. interest to discuss issues which Americans uh, flatly rejected two or three months ago. I mean uh, those technical, military technical uh, details, to say so, uh, about uh, security, uh, about placement of armament and units in Eastern Europe, so conventional arms control and so on. So this is just after uh, the, uh, uh, those demands were put. So of course this diplomatic process continues and we see that uh, despite all hysteria in the West and despite all uh, very firm positions declared, but no one wants to shoot, uh, shoot the door, shut the door. And uh, I think we are on the way to something new. Uh, it will not happen immediately, of course. Assuming that the talks continue between Moscow and Washington, how much progress can they actually make, given that Russia is demanding a right of veto that it doesn't have and knows it doesn't have? How far can they go? Uh, so far, there are no negotiations, uh, actually. So far, we see uh, diplomatic uh, maneuvering around the crisis. Uh, in a classical style, so we can remember something like this both from the Cold War time and even uh, earlier from the uh, earlier periods of diplomacy, classical diplomacy. Uh, I don't think we are there yet. So the real negotiations uh, about the substance, I mean security arrangements in Europe, in Eastern Europe, but larger in Europe uh, uh, it's, uh, per se, uh, will probably start uh, later and before it uh, will arrive, uh, we will see more of uh, demonstrations, including uh, from the Russian side. Now, for example, in Belarus, uh, a big uh, military exercise will be conducted in February. It's not to launch a war, of course, but it's to demonstrate uh, a commitment, so to say, to defend its interest. At the same time, I see that on the both sides, diplomats they uh, have very um, uh, strong and very firm ins instructions so far not to engage in any, any talks about compromises, but they accumulate uh, possibilities and uh, uh, after a while, certainly we will start substantial talk. It will be not the talk about uh, the, this, those demands exactly, but about how to change the basic principles of European uh, security arrangements as they emerged uh, 1990, 1991. I, you say uh, as they emerged at that time. How much of this goes back to uh, the Russian claim that NATO made a promise about not expanding eastwards and then broke it? That's not borne out by the facts, is it? Uh, you know, in Russia, there is absolute axiom, so everybody knows, and that was uh, also uh, documented, uh, not in a written obligation, of course, but uh, uh, we have uh, transcripts from uh, negotiations at that time uh, that uh, U.S. representatives and German representatives uh, promised uh, Mr. Gorbachev that, uh, NATO, that uh, unified Germany's NATO membership will not be a model for the future expansion. Uh, and in this regard, uh, this, uh, this, uh, those reminiscences, uh, the, this memory, uh, spoils uh, uh, the relationship now. And the Russian side, it's very important. But at yeah, the but same time, having said that, that, I don't way. believe it we... It didn't happen that way, did it? I mean, in, in a 2014 interview, Gorbachev himself said the topic of NATO expansion was not discussed at all, and it wasn't brought up in those years. I say this with full responsibility. Not a single East European le leader raised the issue, not even after the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist in 1991. That should have ended the matter, shouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. That's why I also believe that this discussion is senseless. I think you can find a lot of references and uh, literature is very rich now uh, discussing what was said exactly, what was promised, what was not promised. And uh, those words by uh, Secretary Baker, no inch eastwards, uh, they are well known. But again, it doesn't matter anymore. It's uh, psychologically important, but it's not important in terms of real politics. In terms of real politics, one thing is essential. Uh, the European security arrangements 
as they uh, uh, were formulated after, uh, at the end of uh, Cold War and after collapse of the Soviet Union, were de facto based on, on the phenomenon of NATO as the key Euro, uh, key, uh, NATO and the Euro-Atlantic institutions as key elements, as the base, as the core for European security, which meant the more NATO, the more security. And uh, this principle was developed since that pretty uh, linearly, pretty consequently. Russia, initially Soviet Union, then Russia, without big enthusiasm, accepted that at the beginning. But uh, later on, uh, changed mind uh, significantly, and starting from 1990s, Russian establishment and Russian leadership were, were very much concerned and uh, unhappy with NATO expansion, and claimed this, uh, even Boris Yeltsin, but especially Vladimir Putin and his entourage, they made it many, many times. Uh, yeah, it but, didn't help, so we see that NATO... Yeah, but um, yeah, the please. fact is that if you take Ukraine, Moscow's own actions have done far more to push Ukrainian towards NATO than anything the alliance did, haven't they? Why doesn't the Kremlin realize that? Up until Russia invaded Crimea in 2014, there was very little appetite among Ukrainians for joining the alliance. In 2013, less than 20% of the country supported membership. Today, it's almost 60%. So the Kremlin shot itself in the foot, didn't it? Uh, yeah, of course, the situation since uh, 2014 uh, deteriorated significantly. But uh, frankly, I don't believe that uh, international, big international issue, issues, uh, especially those uh, referred to geopolitics and international security, big scale international security, should be decided based on opinion polls, which uh, are changing quite frequently. So uh, what happened in 2014 was not the beginning of the process. That was uh, a, a, an important benchmark of the process, which, as I uh, referred uh, earlier, started immediately after the Cold War. The idea that NATO is available for everybody and NATO is uh, uh, equal to European security, that created a situation which, at the end of the day, led to the, to the uh, performance we have now. So what has NATO done in the last year or so that has brought this crisis to a head? Uh, you mean uh, this particular crisis, the yes. crisis around, yes. uh, around, yeah. uh, around Russian Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, NATO, NATO uh, or rather, uh, I don't believe we should uh, speak about NATO because NATO is just a bureaucratic organization, but particular members which play a uh, most important role, decisive role, with regard to Ukrainian particularly, of course, we see increase of uh, military cooperation, military uh, delivery to Ukraine from uh, particular NATO members, be it Turkey, be it uh, United States, be it UK, and the military capacity of Ukraine is increasing. And of course, uh, Russian military who are responsible for uh, those issues, they, they take it into account. Another thing which uh, has uh, not to do with Ukraine, but uh, I think has uh, a lot to do with the bigger picture, is that uh, uh, in uh, 2021, two things happened which demonstrated uh, uh, that NATO, inside NATO, the situation is actually uh, slightly different than uh, NATO uh, officials and NATO bureaucracy would love to, uh, to demonstrate. I mean, Afghanistan and uh, creation of this AUKUS uh, grouping, uh, when the United States basically decided for themselves what to do. Same in Afghanistan. And I think both of those events brought uh, Russian leadership to, to conclusion that this is right time to start to discuss with Americans how to probably transform the role of NATO in the European security. Why? Because, Why? because, because, America, because America started to look weak in their eyes. Is that it? They thought they could apply more pressure now. No, not, not, no, 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 no. It's not about weakness. It's about priorities. America is strong, and uh, I think no one denies that. But uh, priorities are changing. And uh, NATO as uh, alliance is uh, obviously less prioritized for the U.S. now in the era of a big confrontation with China, uh, which means that uh, probably the general basic view on how to arrange European security and international security, international security might change. It's not about weakness at all. 
What if uh, Moscow doesn't get the security guarantees or the level of confidence from uh, eventual negotiations with America that it's, it's looking for? Um, what, what would it settle for? Uh, let's start by asking that question in relation to Ukraine. What would it settle for? A continuation of the status quo where nobody actually advances uh, Ukraine's membership of NATO, that it's just parked somewhere and left and nothing more happens. Would Moscow settle for that? Uh, you know, uh, that's a very interesting mismatch in perceptions uh, in the West and here, because everything, even from our conversation, everything we hear from the West is that this is Ukrainian crisis, crisis around Ukraine. Uh, so the, the Ukrainian issue is uh, central to this, and Russian ambitions, according to the Western calculations, are about to, to do something with Ukraine. Here is different. Here it is seen as, uh, as a general... Uh, uh, payback, so to say, for 30 plus years of uh, uh, development uh, in Europe and around Europe, uh, and an attempt to uh, renegotiate, even using a demonstration of force and even using uh, unconventional means like this, uh, those demands, uh, renegotiate the principles. And uh, to your question, I don't believe that uh, at the end of the day it might end with nothing because uh, Russia uh, put the question very, very uh, strongly and very boldly. So in one or another form, it will be negotiations, I'm sure. Uh, certainly, uh, no one in Moscow expects to get legally binding guarantees, at, as it, it is claimed. This is a, a well-known uh, uh, initial position uh, it's in diplomacy, the normal, normal phenomenon. But uh, we see already now that uh, debate in the West is starting to change, not about Ukraine, but about the principle, whether it's so important to the West to keep NATO's uh, uh, do doors uh, open as it, as, as it was. Is it really worth uh, uh, doing? And we see that American diplomacy, uh, if we go beyond rhetoric, is actually much more flexible uh, as Russian is. Uh, so I, I guess that we will uh, relatively soon, not immediately, but relatively soon, arrive to the substantial negotiation, which will be based, then it will be based on compromises, not yet. But Mr. Lukyanov, it's a dangerous game, isn't it? Ramping up the tension between two nuclear armed superpowers. It's easy to misread signals, jump to the wrong conclusions. Is this the act of a responsible leader to create and maintain tension? And he seems to be enjoying the tension. In November, he said the pressure on the West was working. This is Vladimir Putin. Our recent warnings have been heard and the effect is noticeable. Tensions have risen. Russia should maintain the tensions as long as possible. Is that really a responsible act from a responsible leader? Uh... This is a, a way uh, which we, uh, so to say, uh, forgot during the last uh, uh, decades when we had an absolute uh, dominance of the United States and, and its allies in international affairs. So at that period, it was impossible to act like this, obviously. But if we look at the history of international relations, it's not unique at all. So it's rather a uh, normal element of uh, hard bargaining. And if we uh, look at the uh, core of the substance, so not just uh, uh, Minsk process or Ukrainian situation, but this is an attempt to revise and to correct uh, international system, which uh, is not satisfactory for uh, some of very powerful actors. Okay, Mo Previously, Moscow it happened only... Moscow talks a lot about threats from the West, and I'm asking what kind of threats, because Mr. Putin's been telling the world for years that the West is in decline, it's decadent, it's weak, liberalism, its core ideology, is in his words, obsolete. If the West's in that much trouble, what kind of danger could it possibly pose to Russia? The arguments don't add up, do they? Uh, you know, uh, this uh, discussion about liberalism, non-liberalism, is another thing. Uh, I think it's uh, a little bit more philosophical and uh, 
when decisions about uh, uh, geopolitical moves are being taken, uh, uh, they, they, they are simpler than, than this uh, very sophisticated uh, argumentation. But uh, uh, the, the weakness, uh, okay, the West is of course not as uh, powerful as it used to be 25 years ago, no doubt about that. But uh, the threat, the military danger or the general danger, uh, again, I just can remind you that uh, Mr. Putin and other Russian officials, they, keep say, they kept saying that uh, since very, very long time, but no one at all wanted to listen to that and they just said, oh, come on, that, that's some Russian, Russian problems, we, we should not take much, uh, much attention to that. So, and unfortunately, yes, uh, what Putin uh, said publicly, openly in November, that we need increased pressure to achieve some kind of uh, interest of our counterparts to listen to our demands. That's unusual, I agree. But uh, that is a product of uh, very long, very fruitless attempts uh, to get it in a different way. Is it dangerous? Yes, of course it's risky. But this is a high stake game. And uh, uh, I'm absolutely sure that Mr. Putin, as we know him, when we know him for pretty, pretty many years already, uh, he is, uh, he's not a gambler. He's a very uh, calculated player, and he's very much aware about all dangers which you referred to about the relationship between uh, nuclear superpowers, very much. In the past few weeks, Russia has been lecturing the West a lot about not respecting the treaties it signed but its own actions have shown the Kremlin feels totally free to violate written commitments and pledges at will. Um, look no further than the invasion and occupation of part of Georgia in 2008, the seizure and annexation of Crimea in 2014, in violation of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, plenty of other agreements. Does the Kremlin believe that that's all been forgiven and forgotten? Uh, it's not about forgiveness, it's not about uh, to, for, uh, to, to, to forget, uh, it's something else. And I think exactly uh, what you say is very important. Because uh, the uh, number of violations of written or uh, oral agreements reached uh, after the Cold War on both sides uh, demonstrate one simple thing, that the system as it emerged uh, did not guarantee uh, that uh, security can be maintained through agreements and it should be uh, changed, it should be adapted to the uh, power balance, to something, to, to circumstances which are objective. Otherwise, we will continue in this way to, to blame each other for uh, who violated what and to be absolutely sure that our uh, our truth is the only one and we need to get it true. Uh, there is another way to try to, as, as it happened before, uh, through diplomacy in um, uh, uh, very um, uh, turbulent times in uh, mankind's history, uh, to try to sit down and to understand why it happened and maybe something went wrong, went wrong after the Cold War when the West was totally euphoric and Russia was depressed. Has something gone badly wrong in Russia? Because the crisis at the moment goes hand in hand with what The Economist magazine called last November a new era of Russian repression. The Russian civil rights group Memorial estimated the number of political prisoners in Russia at around 450, comparable to the Soviet Union in the 1980s. At least it did until Mr. Putin shut the organization down in December. Is the world right to conclude that this signals an increasingly authoritarian rule from the Kremlin now? Uh, the rule in Russia is changing, but of course I would not... Uh exaggerate that, but I don't belong to those who are happy about this development. So personally, I think it's, it's, it's a wrong, wrong direction which should be, should be changed and will be changed inevitably after a while. Uh, the question is different. Uh, do uh, we need to focus on that, on the domestic development in Russia or in China or in the United States, where, wherever? in order to try to achieve more balanced international system. 
So after the Cold War, that was an idea that there are universal values which should be implemented everywhere, and that will be guarantee for a more or less stable peace and security. It didn't work, as we, as we see. So for, probably now we should separate a little bit be, between domestic development in particular countries and uh, international arrangements which should be achieved uh, uh, whatever happens inside those countries. Fyodor Lukyanov, it's been good to have you on Complex Zone. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.